The Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to the service of worship at Westminster. It's wonderful to see everyone here this morning. When you came in, you got, a, you got an order of worship, a bulletin, and you also got a connection card. Uh, we'll be talking about this a little bit later in the service, but I would invite you to go ahead and start feeling, filling it out because at the very end, you're gonna go back and you're gonna drop it in that clear box in the back after having signed up for all of the things we have on the back. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the service. I also want to say that during the service, we're going to be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion together. I have communion up here, and so for those who are able and who want to, you can come forward and receive a piece of bread and then dip it in the grape juice and receive communion that way. But if you would prefer the prepackaged elements that are also gluten-free, those are available in the back. And so you can either sneak out and grab one or just find an usher and they will bring one to you. Um, and just grab that before we get we, ha we have the time of communion in the service. Would you join with me in a word of prayer as we invite the Holy Spirit into our worship? Almighty God, out of the noise of the world, we've come into your sanctuary to still our minds and quiet our hearts and attune ourselves to the worship of the saints and the angels to leave off the clatter of the earth and raise our voices in harmony with all those voices in heaven and earth crying, holy, holy, holy. God, we are here to worship and so direct the eyes of our hearts away from ourselves, away from our distractions, away from our busyness, away from the noise, and in the coming hour, may we gaze on your beauty and your majesty. May we be filled with a sense of awe, a sense of wonder, and a sense of holiness as we worship you together this morning. This we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I invite you to sing with us our opening hymn this morning, Wonderful Words of Life, found on page 600 of your hymnal. Verses 1 through 3. Would you please stand and sing with me?
may be seated. Our scripture today comes from the final chapter of Corinthians. This is the last sermon in our summer-long series on the book of 1 Corinthians. And I have to say, I never realized how long this book was until we did a sermon series on it. Um, I'd never preached on 1 Corinthians before, and I thought, well, maybe I can get through two books, and maybe I could do 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians in the summer. And then I said, no, we're going to be moving fast, and we're just going to get through one book. This is a long book. We've learned a lot. And today, this is the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, chapter, uh, 16, 13. Keep alert. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I am going to invite Miss Millie to come forward. Miss Millie, I don't think we actually have children in here this morning, but you are, please come forward and share with us anyway. So for those of you who haven't been with us, the, the overwhelming vote of the congregation is that we still hear the children's message, even when all the children went to the first service. Well, I, I am happy to expose you to the, uh, this artist that you may not have heard of, Kenneth Wyatt. And he is a Texas artist, and we used him today in our children's message in this way. I asked the kiddos if they liked to paint and draw. And of course, they said yes. And I said, the beautiful thing about this artist, Kenneth Wyatt, is not only was he a talented artist, but he knew that his gift was from God. And he also knew that he wanted any art that he did to please God and to bring glory to God. So then I showed them the picture, this amazing picture of Paul that he painted. I don't know if you can see it or not. But this is a Texas artist. I think he's from maybe West Texas or Central Texas. But this is a picture of Paul. And we talked about is not on his computer. He is not on a cell phone. 2,000 years ago, he is writing letters. And we still read those letters today. How amazing is that? That 2,000 years later, we're still reading his words. And we had them act out the fact that um, the, uh, the artist was also a, um, a great uh, writer. He said, Paul was a traveling man. And so I had him act out. He was a traveling man, right? Constantly on the move, always in danger, sometimes alone, sometimes with a companion, arrested, shipwrecked, beaten, self-proclaimed apostle, did so much for the church that he had to be included in my paintings of the apostles. So what I did is I said that imagine Paul writing the words that we read today in scripture. And those words are, as Pastor Meredith said, from 1 Corinthians, to be strong and watchful and stand firm in your faith. Be courageous, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. And that those words were written 2,000 years ago and we're still reading them. Dear God, thank you so much for the life of Paul. Help us to remember that whatever gifts we have, we want to use them to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to turn in your hymnal to page 375 as we sing together, There is a Balm in Gilead, verses 1 through 3, and you may remain seated.
Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a Don't ever feel discouraged, for Jesus is your friend. And if you look for knowledge, he'll never refuse to lend. There is a bomb in Gilead. Can't preach like Peter if you can't pray like Paul. Then tell the love of Jesus, He died to save us all. There is a the sin sick soul. Amen. So as I said, we are finally at the end of the sermon series on the Corinthians. This morning finds us in the very last chapter. And what I'm going to do with this verse, um, it's a verse that just sort of stuck out to me. It's one of those verses that it's a good one to stitch on your pillowcase, right? It's a good one to write down and put it on, um, put it on wall art or putting it on something. I'm pretty sure when I was in high school, I had this verse on a piece of jewelry that I wore either as a bracelet or as a um, a necklace. I want to unpack this verse with you, because, and I want to unpack it in the light that it was originally preached in, which was to the community. So what we tend to do with verses like this, and let me read it again. This is one of his summary verses. So he's at the very end, he's giving, he's giving his greetings, he's giving his final words, and he throws this in. Keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous and strong. Let all that you do be done in love. He throws that in at the end, and that's one of the ones that, man, it's a good memory verse, right? It's a good one to carry with you. But what we tend to do with it is we tend to individualize it because we individualize everything. So I remember when I was in high school and I had that stand firm in your faith. I had that. It was either as a necklace or as a bracelet. I don't remember which, but I remember I had it and I wore it with me. And my Bible study was like, you can hold on to that medal and you can feel that medal every time you are out there and you're thinking about compromising your faith. You can remember to stand firm. And that's a great message, right? But that's a very individualized version of that message. When Paul was writing these words, he wasn't writing to a bunch of individuals who were going to hear this. He was writing to a community, and these words were to be implemented in the community together. In fact, the entire book has been one long treatise on what community actually is. 
what it means to be in the body of Christ, what it means to be taken from our own individual lives and knit into the body of Christ and made more than we are as individuals and do life together. And at the very end of this, this final exhortation, stand firm, be courageous, do all in love, was not written to carry out an individual life. It was written to inform communal life. So what I want to do in this sermon is I want to do kind of a recap sermon. What have we learned this summer? What have we learned this summer? But I want to do it through these words written to the community at Corinth and to every community who hears the words of these letters since then. Keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous and strong, let all that you do be done in love. Okay, let's break that down into three different sections. So the first two kind of go together. The keep alert and stand firm in your faith. Keep alert um, is also translated, if you look at different translations of this, as be watchful, be on your guard, keep an eye out. Now, why? what is the implication if I'm telling you to be watchful? The implication is there's something you need to look out for, right? So when I'm, t when I'm telling my daughter, be watchful, it's because I know that she's about to fall off the couch she's trying to climb on, right? I know she's about to hurt herself in some way, and so there's something I need her to be careful of, be mindful of. And so that's the first thing, be mindful, be, um, be watchful, stand firm in your faith. Now, what does that stand firm in your faith refer to? Well, that harkens back to the first four chapters where Paul addresses this troublesome congregation. The first thing he says is, you already know what you need to know. You knew it back when we first preached it to you. You had the gospel, and I know you had the gospel because I saw the Holy Spirit show up, and you got that all back at the beginning. You got it back at the beginning. And so just in case you forgot, Paul says, let me recap it for you. And so he does. And so the first four chapters, we have Paul's recapping of the core of the gospel, which is this. We preach Christ and Christ crucified because the foolish wisdom of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the wisdom of God. And the implication of that was that preaching Christ crucified was more than simply preaching a historical event. It was preaching a lifestyle whereby those who follow the crucified Christ also take up their crosses and follow him. Also remove themselves from the people, from the positions of power whereby they get puffed up and puffed up and instead they start following the crucified Christ to the lonely and the lost and the least and the dark places of the world. And they followed the crucified Christ in paths that look to the world like foolishness, but are in fact the wisdom and the salvation of God. And so Paul says to this community that is bickering with one another, trying to one-up each other, trying to lord it over each other, trying to brag to each other, Paul says, you've forgotten the basics. We follow, we worship a crucified Christ. Now, I want to pair that together with, you, with that first statement. Be careful. Stand firm in your faith. What is it that we need to be careful of? Friends, I think the eternal temptation to the Corinthians and to us is to hear the gospel, accept it, repent, and then become so comfortable with it that we forget how different it is from what the world wants us to do. So the famous tendency of Christian churches is to try to take the cross out of the church. And sometimes that is metaphorical and sometimes it is quite literal. There's a famous preacher about 50 years ago who famously took the cross out of the church because he says, who wants to see a sign of failure in a place that's preaching success? And he's right. Christians are terrible at marketing. This is not a great marketing strategy. When we literally put an ancient sign of torture in the middle of the sanctuary, and then not only do we do that, we say, take up your cross and follow Jesus. And that's what we're selling. And so the more astute businessmen among past Christians have said, you know, we'd get more people if we just didn't do that. And they were right. You do. And even those who do not take the cross physically out of their churches 
over the course of a lifetime of compromising with our culture, find themselves taking the cross spiritually out of our communities, where we become a community of people built on pride, built on lording it over, built on building up our own empires, built on proving who is right, and we have lost the worship of the crucified Christ. It happens time and time and time again, and so Paul says, be careful, be careful, be watchful, be mindful, keep alert. This tends to happen. Don't let it happen to you. In this case, don't let it happen to you again, because <laughs> you've already done it once. Be alert, stand firm in the faith. The second phrase is this, be courageous and be strong. I love that phrase. And I love it because it is so not stereotypically Christian. So when we talk about the things that we tend to put on our Christian jewelry or our Christian t-shirts or paint on our walls, it's stuff about being patient and kind and loving. It is stuff about being, in, in a lot of other fancy words, nice and that that's great. We need to be patient and kind and loving. In fact, Paul hit the Corinthians over the head with an entire chapter about how they needed to be patient and kind and loving. And yet in this phrase, he reminds them this, that when you actually try to do that, when you actually try to live out the ethic that has been presented, not only in the gospel, but in the, the gospel proclamation of the community, you find it takes quite a bit of courage to actually do it. And you find it takes quite a bit of fortitude to keep showing up. And it is far easier and far simpler to just not do it. And so Paul says this, be strong. Be strong. Be courageous. Be courageous. I want you to think back with me. The whole middle section of Corinthians, Paul hit us over the head with a theology of community that should shake us up because it shakes everyone up. He started back with 1 Corinthians 8 where he made, this he made this argument that eating meat was sin for some and not sin for others, but then he made this implication that if I make you stumble with the way I behave, I'm in fact sinning because you are my responsibility and I am your responsibility because together in a community we belong to each other and so we take care of each other's spiritual health because that is what we do. And let me tell you, friends, that is a hard thing to do. And you know how it gets even harder? The next couple chapters later, 1 Corinthians 12, is he is unpacking this theology of spiritual gifts. And so he says, every single one of you have been gifted, but you're like a body. And you only function well when they're all together. And so you might figure out that your gifting is as an eye, which is wonderful, but you're not going to function well unless you're paired with a hand and a foot and a head. And all of these need to work together, and you need to be able to acknowledge your need as well as your gift. And if you cannot do both, then the body is going to be out of whack. And so this teaching was that we need each other, we belong together, and the work of being together in community, of exercising our spiritual gifts together in community, requires not just our strength, but also our weakness. Requires not just our gifts, but also our need. Requires not just what we can do, but what we can rely on others to do. Requires, requires us to show up with our best selves and also allow others to help when we are our worst selves. And let me tell you, friends, doing that takes courage. It takes real courage, especially today. Because it is so much easier to just not show up. Right? If I find out that I got a gift for being an I, the easier thing to do it's for me to go off on my own and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to live into my gift. I'm going to do my best. And yet in doing that, in disconnecting ourselves from the community, we become less useful because what use is an eye without a head? Right? 
what use, and we don't see it that way, because we are very proud of what we can do. And if God only knew what we could do on our own, boy, could he get a lot done. And Paul draws us back, says, you are not meant to be all in all on your own. As great as you are, you're meant to be a part of a community. Your gift is essential, but it is not the only gift that is essential. All gifts are essential. And all gifts functioning together is what makes the kingdom come. All gifts functioning together is what makes the kingdom come. Let me tell you, this is some of the hardest stuff that you will ever do in your life. Being like, Life together is hard. Life together is hard, whether it's a marriage, or whether it's a small group, or whether it's a church, or whether it's a bowling league. I don't care what community it is, life together is hard. And there are always times that we are tempted to just leave and do it alone because that's so much easier. At which point Paul stands up and he says, you know what? Have a little bit of courage. <laughs> Strengthen that part inside of you that wants to walk away right now because you can do hard things. And you're supposed to do this hard thing. Be strong. Be courageous. Do everything in love. It shouldn't surprise you that this is where he ends. This is the last chapter of the book that includes the famous love chapter. And so it shouldn't surprise you that the climax of this final exhortation, stand firm in your faith, be strong and courageous, do everything in love, that should not surprise you. What I want you to hear, though, is that even though we like to say this, and we like to memorize it, and boy, do we like to put it on wall art, it is really hard to do. Harder than you think. Love is one of those things that sounds like a great idea until you have to do it when you don't want to. It's kind of like forgiveness. Everyone loves the idea of forgiveness until they have someone to forgive, and then it's highly overrated. Everyone loves the idea of love until they have to do it day in, day out, to people they don't necessarily get along with all the time. And that is where Paul leaves us. You, be strong and courageous. Stand in your faith. Do everything in love. You know, the other thing about that is that it's not particularly admired by our culture anymore. They say it is. People will always say, right, you ask anyone on the street, no one's going to be like, I prefer hate to love. Right? That's not a thing someone's going to say. And yet, look at the qualities that are idolized by our culture, it is not humility, it is not kindness, it is not patience, it is not endurance, it is not any of the qualities that make up love. It's snarkiness, it's wittiness, it's meanness. My ability to cut down everyone else in the wittiest and meanest way I can is greatly rewarded by our culture. A group that can function together and get a task done, but still by, by, while being mean to people within the group, that's, that's valued by our culture. A group that genuinely loves and serves one another in humility and mutual submission, the culture might say it's okay, but it's never gonna make the headlines because it's boring. And ultimately, in the eyes of our world, it is not a worthwhile goal. It is not a worthwhile go. And yet, what does Jesus say? How will they know that you're my followers? You will be marked as my followers by the way in which you love each other. People from the outside looking in will tell that you are my disciples by the way in which you love each other. And the implication, people from the outside looking in will be able to tell that you are not my followers by the way in which you fail to love one another. Communities marked by backbiting and one-upping and pride and jealousy. Whatever they may call themselves are not actually following Christ. And so Paul says this, whatever else you do, do everything in love. Whatever else you do, whatever else it looks like, whatever else it means to find your gift and live it out, whatever else it means to be a part of the community, 
make sure your community and your participation in your community is marked by kindness, by generosity, by patience, by bearing all things and believing all things and hoping all things and enduring all things. And if it gets hard, don't lose courage because it's still worth it. Friends, that kind of community is never going to make the news, ever. It would be the most boring story ever. And yet, from the perspective of God, it's the, one, it's the way that the world has changed, right? It's the way that God actually shows up and works in the world. As I was preparing the sermon, there were a couple different stories that came to mind. The first one was actually the horrific story several years ago. Do you remember the um, Amish schoolhouse shooting that happened? Horrible, horrible story. But what got me was the headlines that followed where all of these media, this is one example of a, of a community actually making the news, but all these media outlines were, outlets were stunned by the basic Christian decency of the Amish people. In fact, I read a headline that was literally, Preacher says we shouldn't hate gunmen. And that was a headline because apparently he'd never heard that before. Right? And what we know, because we know the scriptures that they're reading, is that quiet, that community had been quietly practicing love for generations. They had been quietly raising families and going generation after generation after generation, practicing an ethic of love and patience and, yes, forgiveness and reconciliation with each other so much that when this horrible tragedy entered, it was just second nature because it's what they already did. But it never became headlines until, some, until this horrible thing happened and someone from the outside noticed it. And so no, it's never going to be headlines. It's never going to be exciting. It's never going to be something that is actually commended by the world because the world doesn't actually value it. And yet, it is what changes the world. So the other story that came to mind was actually one my mom told me. My mom had a rough childhood. And her childhood was so rough that her teenage rebellion was going to church. There was a church she could walk to, so she got up, she got herself dressed, she left the house without her parents' permission, and she went to church on Sundays. And there was this little Lutheran congregation in her um, hometown, it was the only one she could walk to, and she went and she sat in that service every Sunday morning. And there were a lot of elements in her life, but what she said was, Meredith, they loved me in a way that I had never experienced. And let's be clear, these folks probably only just hugged her and gave her a donut, right? Like there wasn't a whole lot going on, but she sat in that room, she absorbed the ethos of the community, and they welcomed her back week after week after week. And the love she experienced through the community gave her the hope and the strength and the courage to leave her home and not return to it. She said, it's that church that gave me the courage to move on and to think that maybe I could, it was the first time I'd experienced that kind of love before, to think that maybe I could find that kind of love, that there was something different in my life. And the reason, so I thought about her story, and then I thought about my story. I grew up in a great home. I was, in a, I was a preacher's kid, so I grew up in church, but like literally in church. So I was in the church building more often than I was in my bedroom. So recently I went back to that church and I walked in and I was like, it still smells the same. <laughs> I know all of these walls, I know all of these rooms very, very well. And I grew up in church and I grew up just swimming in a sea and taking it for granted because I, I was surrounded by so much love, I didn't even recognize it. Right? So I was, I was walking through the sea of people, all of whom knew me, all of whom were praying for me. I have more teachers that raised me than I can even name for you. I have more, God bless them, children's volunteers that blessed me than I can even name for you. And the imprint it left on my life was that I, I grew up assuming that I was loved by God assuming that I held a place in God's family, in God's world. And I got to college and I was talking to a friend who said that they just always wrestled with feeling like God hated them. And I was like, really? Because that, I mean, I was a guilty child, but this feeling that like God hated me, 
that never occurred to me. That never occurred to me. And it was because I had absorbed the love of God through the love of the community, like a fish swimming in the sea. And then I have to close it with one more story because this week we had our art camp. And so for those of you who are not familiar, art camp is when we take children under five, like a million of them, a million children under the age of five, and we give them paint and clay and paint brushes, and we say, have fun. <laughs> and it was wonderful and chaotic and wonderful. Um, and my daughter, who my four-year-old, was one of those chaotic children, and so she would rotate through story time and we would do singing and story, and then I would like kind of hand her on to the next people and be like, thank you, and I'm sorry, and, <laughs> and all of this. And there's just this is kind of wonderful chaos all week long. One of the songs that we sang was, um, God Makes Messy Things Beautiful. It was, it was a song that we played in the background when they were doing crafts, because the whole camp was about God making beautiful things. And so we had the song, God Makes Messy Things Beautiful. After the camp ended, I, uh, I went in to Annabelle because she was still wearing her camp shirt. She was doing her memory verse. And I went in, and the first thing I noticed is that she had spilled her snack all over the table. And I was like, Annabelle, what is this mess? And she looks up at me and she goes, God makes messy things beautiful. <laughs> I was like, you are a smart child. Also, you've got to clean up this mess now. And then she looks up at me and she goes, Mom, I love church. And it hit me because I realized it's happening again. It's happening again. This, I am the, I'm the product of a person who was saved from the darkness by the love of a community. I am a person who was guided and grown by the love of a community. And now I am raising my children in a community that loves them, even though they're never even going to know how, the, the extent to which people went through to love them. Right? They're never going to be able to name all those volunteers. They're never going to know how many hours went into making those crafts. They're never going to know any of that. But she's getting the love because she's being, she's being surrounded by people who do all things in love. Friends, it's never going to make the news. My testimony to you this morning is that it doesn't matter if it doesn't make the news. That is how God changes the world. That's how it happens. That is how the kingdom comes. That is how disciples are made. That is how the love of God is spread. And when this community chooses to do all things in love, and, ex and whenever people come into the community, they feel it. They absorb it. Whether they are in here for a day, whether they are in here for a lifetime, when this community chooses to do all things in love, it changes people. And changing people changes the world. And so, Westminster, to the congregation of the faithful, be alert. Stand firm in your faith. Be strong. Be courageous. And whatever happens, never stop doing all things in love. Would you join with me in prayer? Almighty God, you have given us all things. You have invited us into your story. You have forgiven us, redeemed us. You have made beautiful things out of the messiness of our life. And you have brought us out of our lives and into your community. God, we are imperfect. We are a mess. We are people who try and fail. We are people who sometimes forget to try. We are people who are super committed for some time and then we just stop and we forget about it and then we show up. We are people who fall again and again and again. And so we rely on your grace because your grace is stronger than our weakness. So forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. And this above all, instill in us your love, that as your love beats in our heart, it might overflow into the lives of those around us. That they might know the love of God because we, in obedience to you, do all things together in love. This is our prayer as the body of Christ 
and the people of God. As we say together the prayer our Lord taught, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this morning we'll be sharing together in the Sacrament of Holy Communion. This is an ancient sacrament. Every Christian congregation shares it in some way. We say together a prayer that's called the Great Thanksgiving. It's found on page 9 in your hymnals, and then we use sung responses. For those of you who've not been with us before, this is just the Methodist version of a prayer that's said by many, many different churches. In fact, the reason we say this is that there are elements of this prayer that were drawn from very, very old documents describing how early Christians used to pray when they came to table together. And so when we say these words, we say them not only in unison with each other, we say them in unison with Christians across, across time, across space, across ages, as Christians together have celebrated what it means to be the body of Christ. One bread, one body. Would you join with me in the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God, and you spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and your Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. May they be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen, amen, amen. Friends, um, in
in just a few moments, Chris and I are going to be at the front with communion elements. And here's how this works. If you would like to receive, when you are ready, you get up and come forward. I will give you a piece of bread. You can dip it in the grape juice. And so receive both of the elements together. When you're finished, you can kneel and pray, or you can return to your seat and pray. But when you're finished, that's the part where we, we go into the part of the service that we call the offering, which is when you, after having received in gratitude the word of God and the body of Christ, you go and you say thank you for what you've received, and then you start to offer back to God out of all that he has given you. So the turn is that we are fed, and then we turn to feed others. And so the offering is we ask God, what do you need of me? What do you ask of me to feed others now? So you can, if you have a tangible offering, you can leave it on the altar rail. You can also leave it in the clear box at the back. You can give online at wumc.com. And then you can prayerfully offer your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, your witness, as you are either kneeling or in your seats. And then we'll come back and finish the service with our proclamation of faith. And so when you are ready, come taste and see that the Lord is good.
Would you stand with me as we affirm our faith together with the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. join us in singing our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance, found on page 369 of your hymnal, and we'll conclude with verses one through three. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. My Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst in my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. I'm going to invite you to be seated for just a moment because we have some announcements today. So if you flip that connection card over, you see a whole lot of stuff on the back. And that's because there's a lot of stuff coming up. We are kind of rounding the bend of summer into that final sprint before the school year starts. And here's what we have. So August 28th is our third town hall. We've had two town halls right now to lay out all the information about the building project coming up. 
the third town hall is gonna be officially to vote moving forward. And so if you've got final questions, final suggestions, final input, my door is open, Casey's door is open. Uh, the chair of the board is Jennifer Romilis. We'd love to hear from you. We're gonna get together on the 28th. We're gonna vote to move forward and then we're gonna talk about next steps and how we can keep everyone um, in the loop about plans as they're being made. That's on the 28th. Um, third Town Hall on the 28th, that's right. New to Westminster luncheon is going to happen September 18th. So that is a while away, but we're gonna start talking about it now to get it on your calendar. If you are either a new member or if you've not joined the church, if you just wanna know a little bit more about Westminster, this is what this is for. It's a lunch that will happen immediately after this service. It will have me, all the, all the staff, the leaders of the ministries, and um, you will get to hear all about Westminster, all about how to plug in. And if you want to join the church at that luncheon, you can join the church right then and there. This is like the introvert friendly um, joining the church method where you don't have to walk up front. And so if you want to do that, that's available to you. And um, we're getting the word out now so that everyone can get it on their calendar. That's September 18th. The other thing happening, October, August 31st, so the Wednesday after the town hall, we're starting our Wednesday night series on practical tips for discipleship. This is something that's going to be useful to absolutely everyone. We've, we've staged this, this series of workshops so that it could be um, useful even at different levels of involvement, different levels of discipleship and commitment. The idea is that we're gonna give you tools to enable you to go one step deeper in your life, whatever that looks like. So if you've ever, been in a Sunday morning sermon and then wanted some practical tools about like, so what does this mean when my friend tells me she has cancer? Like, what do I say? What do I not say? This is what this is about. Um, it's going to be super useful, very practical, and it will be a great chance to get to know some of the people that you're worshiping with. Those will be Wednesday nights, August 31st, all the way through October 5th. And the reason we stop on October 5th is because, you know, it's coming, the pumpkin patch. The pumpkin patch is the single biggest outreach to the community we do all year, and it is the biggest outreach to the community because we are so tired at the end of it that we need a break for another year. But it is so much fun. It is a fantastic outreach. Um, the lawn transforms into kind of a beautiful pumpkin patch, and then we host lots of things, and this year especially, We've got lots of things that we're hosting. We welcome families onto the patch. We welcome all these kids. Um, it is, it's just a, it's a wonderful month long celebration of community and fall and who doesn't love pumpkins? Uh, we need so many volunteers hours to make it happen. And so it is literally an all hands on deck kind of thing. You are never too young or too old. We can use you in any capacity, whether it's unloading pumpkins or whether it's working the patch. If you can give us a couple of hours, great. If you can give us a lot of hours, great. We can use every hour we can get. And so if you've not already, sign, sign up on the connection card, get in touch with Casey, get plugged into the schedule as we're creating it for the volunteer schedule. Schedule. And let's, uh, let's enjoy this opportunity to love on our community again this year. My brothers and sisters, receive these words of blessing as you depart. Go in peace and go in hope and go in faith. Go in joy, go in courage, and today especially, go in love. Go knowing that the love that beats within you is the love of God that was powerful enough to conquer even death. And so as you walk in that love, you are walking in strength and you are walking in life. You are walking in resurrection and you are walking in glory. Go bearing that love to a world that desperately needs that love. In the name of God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen.